Um, my name is Dina. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so currently I work at Google, but today I'm going to talk to you about sure, the experience yeah. I gained from a little less than 10 years before working at Google. Um, and that's .NET uh, memory optimizations and management. Uh, we're going to talk about garbage collection, how we can make your application's footprint, memory footprint smaller, and thus reduce the time that your application spends doing memory management. So in a little more detail, uh, what are we going to do? First, I'm going to try to give you some motivation about why this topic is even important, because it's true that memory allocation is easy, but it's not free. It's cheap, but it's not free, and it adds up, and it has side effects. After we're going to motivate you to talk about this subject, I'm going to give you some examples about common uh, coding patterns that you probably see every day, and how, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I skipped a part. <laughs> Obviously, first we're going to talk about identifying that you have a memory footprint pro uh, problem, memory management problem, and after that, <laughs> we're going to go over a few common uh, coding patterns that you might encounter every day in your code and see how they affect the performance on your applications. And finally, we're going to see a few more tips and, tri and tricks about how you can improve your applications even further, but without going too deeply into them. So let's begin. <laughs> As I said, first I'm going to try to motivate you. We all know that memory allocation is not hard, right? All we have to do to allocate a new object is to move the uh, uh, heap pointer from one location to another. That's very easy, it's very cheap, but it adds up if you have a lot of them. And the even more severe problem is that all these memory allocations, they have side effects, or rather one main side effect, and that's garbage collection. Because the more you allocate, the more you have to collect. And we're going to see throughout the talk how long exactly that might take in some severe cases. And the reason I'm saying this, I know it sounds obvious, but like from my experience at least, usually when developers talk about optimizing and making their applications better, we usually think about like, you know, algorithms and data structures and like um, time, CPU time optimizations. But it's not until we suddenly encounter a very severe memory management problem that we suddenly remember that, hey, you know, garbage connect collection, is, it's not magic. It's not the magic pill. And memory is something that we definitely have to think about. So all throughout the talk, I'm going to show you real life examples, a little from my own experience, but also a lot of stuff I found in Stack Overflow. People keep asking about memory uh, management, garbage collection, how you can reduce times, how can you find out what your process is doing, why it's doing GC. And here's an example. This is someone asking about, they have a Unity application, um, and they're complaining about the update method taking a long time. Obviously, update is something important that we want to make as fast as possible. And this person ran a profiler, and they found out that about 33% of the uh, time of the update method is spent inside GC collect. Now, 33% inside your update function is a very, very long time. So again, it's not just theory, it's real life. People encounter these sort of things. So I, I think we're motivated enough. Um, let's talk about identification, because before we start optimizing our application, we have to know what our bottlenecks are. It's not necessarily memory problems. So let's see a few tools and a few ways where we can find out what's going on in our application memory-wise. So I think that the easiest way to monitor our application uh, memory performance, and well, performance is general, in general, is performance counters. Performance counters is like an API, or let's call them some sort of objects, which are, which are spread out throughout the entire Windows system, and they're able to, uh, to give us numerical data about stuff that's going on. It can be either for the entire system, like the entire memory used, or for specific processes, which is what interests us. And it really is throughout the entire system. So it can give us data about disk usage, CPU usage, the number of threads, 
um, number of writes, size of writes and reads, and of course everything memory related, both managed and native. So in managed we have the size of the heap, we have statistics about garbage collections, about the generations, about the time that garbage collection takes, really a whole load of stuff. Um, and it's very easy to use them. You don't need to recompile or even restart your application. You just need to like tap into the API using the correct tool, which are, by the way, freely available inside Windows as well. So, if, for example, you have typeperf, which is a command line tool you can use to read any uh, performance counter on your system, or perfmon, which we're going to see in a moment, which is a <coughs> excuse me, which is a which is a UI again for tapping into all these performance counters. And as a side note, I will mention that you can also write your own, create your own performance counters and, uh, and emit them from your application. For example, maybe the size of some processing queue that you have. And this would allow you to easily monitor your application if you need that. But that's not the scope of our talk. So like, just remember that it's possible. Um, but this is less interesting for us right now. So, this is a screenshot of Perfmon, and oh, I hope you can see, uh, but if not, I'm going to read to you what it says. Um, I wrote a certain application which does some processing, um, and I asked Perfmon to monitor a few metrics for me. So the first one is the size of, uh, of, the, of the memory, of the total uh, heap memory. The second one is the total size, I think. Another one is the number of allocations, and another one is the uh, time that the application spends doing GC. So if you look at the graph, the light green one, that's the size of the heap, of the managed heap. And you can see that it's fairly constant over time. Um, I conclude from that that we probably don't have a memory leak or anything like that, so that's good, we're happy about that. However, the bold red line represents the percentage of time that my application spends doing GC. And again, I don't see if you, I don't know if you see the numbers, they're pretty uh, small, but it's like 50, 60%. Imagine that like half the time that your application is running on the CPU, it's doing GC. <laughs> That's not normal. Okay, so we don't have a memory leak, but we definitely have some sort of memory management problem. Now, the problem with this is that I now know that I have a problem, but very sadly, I have no idea what to do about it. I don't know why I'm doing GC. I don't know what's causing this. Well, that's because performance counters are just numbers. So luckily for us, uh, Windows has a solution for that as well. There is another tracing mechanism embedded in Windows, comes built in, called event tracing for Windows. Event tracing for Windows is similar to performance counters in the sense that it's spread out all across the system and can give you data about what's going on, but it's not just numerical data. It's a, it's a structured logging framework which supports hundreds of thousands of messages per second. It has a very low overhead, especially if it's turned off. And similarly to performance counters, you don't have to recompile or restart your application. You just need to like kind of turn on the viewer that looks at, these, at this data, and you would get all of this information available for you. And again, it's really everywhere. It's in drivers, it's in services, it's all over .NET, it's in managed and native memory. Even third-party components can emit ETW data. For example, Chrome has ETW logs available. And, um, and this would allow you, as we will see soon, to get much more insight into what's going on. And again, I will mention as a side note that you can write your own ETW logs as well, which is pretty cool because it allows you to give much more data about what your application is doing uh, for your like monitoring systems to monitor, uh, but this is also outside the scope of our talk. So let's, uh, let's look at something. 
I'm not going to run this live because all this uh, profiling and monitor takes a lot of time. So mostly we're going to see a lot of screenshots today. I apologize for that. Um, but what I want to show you now is the result of such an ETW uh, recording. Do you remember that uh, the process that we saw before in Perfman, the one that didn't have a leak but hi had very high uh, garbage collection rates? So I actually recorded the same application using an ETW recorder, and let's look at the results. This is an application called Perfu. You can download load it for free uh, from, uh, from, actually it's not from Microsoft's website. If you find it on Microsoft's website, it's a very old version. You should download it from Microsoft's GitHub. That's the latest version. Um, and this application allows you both to record the logs, which I'm not going to show you now, uh, and to view and analyze the results later. Now, it's not very pretty, <laughs> I apologize, uh, but it's very, very useful <laughs> and has a lot of interesting features that allow you to analyze your data. So this is my recorder. The application is called Jack Compiler, and I want to see what the CPU was doing. So I'm going to look at CPU, um, yeah, at the CPU data here for my specific process. And I get, again, this not very pretty UI, but I can see all of the functions that my application was calling and the time that it took. And in fact, let me just remove the filtering here. These are all the functions that were called by application. I can order them by execution time, for example. And well, obviously the root, you know, the process itself is everything, and then some stuff that has to do with the, with the threads, and we have a parser, which is not surprising because we're talking about a compiler here. Remember the name of the application. Um, and this is interesting information. Let me just scroll down um, if I can find it quickly and show you. We have a lot of GC stuff here, and it's not surprising because we already know that GC takes a long time. Um, and we have a lot of allocations. You can see here uh, the inclusive time that allocation took. So 30% of my application is also um, some sort of allocations which might also be interesting and troubling. But I think that the most important part is, well, we already know that we have a problem, but we want to know why. What's the stack that causes this, right? So I will double click this allocation, and it immediately takes me to a call stack tree that shows me where allocations are happening. And we can see here that, in fact, it comes from string concat, which in turn comes from writing all sorts of stuff, which essentially goes back to some, you know, some of my code. And with this knowledge, I can now go to ba my back to my code and see, well, why, you know, maybe I'm not concatenating strings very efficiently. Maybe I should use a string builder, for example. That might help. But let's see what other interesting information this tool can give me. When I recorded this trace, I also asked ETW to save data about allocations. And we can see it here in the memory uh, window where I can see all of the types that were allocated by, uh, by my application. And what we can see <laughs> is that an absolutely astounding amount of large objects were allocated by my application. Now, this is not very useful because like an, a large object could be anything, but incidentally, we see that it's also the same uh, number of strings. And if we already know that we have a lot of time going into string concat, and we know that string concatenation creates a lot of intermediate objects, and we see in our like, you know, memory uh, uh, statistics that we allocate a lot of strings, that like, the entire image starts getting cleared up. And even here, if I double click this type here, it takes me to a call stack tree where I can see that all these strings 
were created by string concatenation. And if I expand that, again, I see that it comes from my tokenizer in my compiler, okay? So this ETW trace allowed me to find out a lot about what was causing the problems that we identified using uh, perfmon. So I think this is pretty cool, actually. And by the way, just again, as a side note, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Perfue. There are a whole lot of screens here. <laughs> you can look at it. ETW has a lot of data, not just for memory and CPU. It also has stuff about accessing files and threading and stuff. There's a whole bunch of data that you can see here. It's really worth your time to like, play around with this tool a little bit. Cool. So, static code analysis. Imagine you can find bugs in your code without even starting to run it. That's the idea of static code analysis. The idea is that an automatic tool kind of like does a code review for you. It goes over your code and detects all sorts of problem. Usually this is based on, well, maybe complicated, but at the end of the day, some coding patterns, pattern matching that it finds in your code. So for example, if you're not disposing an iDisposable, a static analyzer can find that. Or if you don't pass enough uh, arguments to your right line function, a static an analyzer, analyzer could find that, you know, if there's no match between the number of arguments and the number of, uh, of placeholders in your string. Um, it can also find stuff like inefficient string concatenations. Right? I mean, it's very easy to find that you're using a plus operator between strings rather than a string builder. So this is something that a static analyzer could help you a lot with. And there is an abundance of tools out there, starting from stuff that are built in. Visual Studio has some statistics available. ReSharper has more stuff available. There are commercial tools like Coverity that cost thousands of dollars per year last time I checked, uh, <laughs> and, um, and it mainly depends on like, you know, how much money and effort you want to invest in that. So let's see an example. Let's see an, let's see an example. So this is a screenshot, but I can actually show you this in real time. I'm going back to my Visual Studio, and this is the project that contains all of the demos that we're going to see today. And I installed a plugin called, uh, an extension called CLR Heap Analyzer. Um, it's free. You can just install it from the uh, extensions area, whatever. Um, and it finds all sorts of stuff for you. So for example, here, I double click it. I concatenate strings. And it tells me even, first of all, it has like this squiggly line that shows that I'm making an allocation. And it even tells me consider using String Builder. It's very nice of the extension to tell me that. Um, here is another example. We have a lambda here, and we're going to talk more thoroughly about lambdas later, but also the squiggly lines tell me that there's an allocation happening here that maybe I don't realize is happening. This can be very useful because it means that as you write the code, you get these hints that tell you, hey, something is happening here that you might not be aware of or just forgot. Cool. And the last thing, tool, I want to show or concept that I want to talk to you about is dynamic memory profiling. Because even though it's cool to find out all your problems before running the application, it's not always possible or it's not always very easy. Some things are very hard to uncover or detect without some sort of temporal analysis, without looking at how your application runs on specific inputs or specific situations. And here dynamic memory profiling comes to help us. So these are tools that basically allow you to kind of tap into your process's memory during runtime and take snapshots and analyze those snapshots and compare these snapshots. Obviously, uh, it's very easy to use these tools for finding memory leaks because once you can compare the state of your application's memory between several points in time, you can understand which types grow 
in the allocations over time. It might allow you to find out what's causing the leak. And again, just as with static analysis, here too, there are many tools available. Um, I, I actually don't have a lot of experience with a lot of them, but usually we're talking about commercial tools. Now, here's an interesting point. You saw ETW, and ETW obviously allows you to find out everything you want about your process. So you might want to ask yourself, why would I use these tools? Indeed, some of these tools get their data from ETW logs. However, the, thing, the, the feature that you pay for <laughs> is the nice UIs, uh, in some cases automatic an analysis that do not require you sitting, like going through manually all these uh, textual logs. Uh, we will see some screenshots in a moment that show you how easy it can become, uh, how, uh, and it can save you a lot of time when a tool does this analysis for you. So for example, let's look here. This is a different application, not the one that we were analyzing before. Um, I was running this uh, application, which is conveniently uh, called memory leak, and <laughs> I noticed that memory was increasing over time. So I took several snapshots, and what you can see here is that an object called response where is it? Okay, an object called re of type response grew in its size from one, uh, from one uh, snapshot to another. And conveniently for me, all I have to do is just like double click or go to another screen and it would show me this very nice graph that tells me exactly what's keeping all of these responses in memory, why they're not being freed by the garbage collector. Specifically in this case, it turns out that the response, well, it's an array of responses, eventually is kept by something called response cache, which is a static uh, variable, which obviously prevents from my data from going away. And again, with this knowledge, I can now go back to my code and fix whatever is needed. Maybe I need a timer that cleans the cache. I don't know, maybe I need to limit its size. Uh, but whatever it is that we decide to do for the features of our specific application, we now have the data uh, to back it up and to go find the prob fix the problem. Okay, so we have the tools. We identified that we have a problem. Let's try to understand what common .NET practices that we use every day, I'm sure we'll use every day, uh, can cause uh, such nasty uh, memory management problems. So, as I said before, the internet really is full of a lot of examples about people encountering these, these kind of problems. So, in this case, someone had a dictionary, a, a the, you know, uh, of stuff, of vectors, whatever. And he noticed that whenever he reads from the dictionary, and again, I'm stressing out, only read from the dictionary, not write into it. Memory was being allocated. So again, I will repeat that. There's a dictionary, I read from the dictionary, but for some reason memory is allocated. This is kind of weird, right? And especially taking into account that dictionaries are supposed to be uh, very fast, right? It's kind of surprising that memory is, is, is allocated when I just read stuff. So you're a lot of people, so I'm not going to ask if anyone knows the answer. Uh, but the reason that memory is, uh, is allocated when we access this dictionary is boxing. So, let's see. Uh, boxing, well, just in case somebody doesn't know, uh, boxing is what happens when you pass a value type to an interface that receives an object. Objects, reference types, and value types are different. They have, uh, uh, objects have a header, they have all sorts of metadata coming with it, they support, uh, they support uh, interfaces and, and virtual methods, and so we can't pass a value type straight the way it is into such a function. So we have to wrap it into an object and stick the value inside. 
and this is memory allocation. So let's try to measure um, how this affects our application. So I'm going to do a little benchmark, and it's going to be something like this. Let's say that we have a data structure, a very simple data structure. All that it has inside is single int. Imagine it's a one-dimensional point, okay? And let's say we're doing some sort of a mathematical computation or some image processing or something, and we have an array of such points, of such data structures, and we want to search inside. That sounds easy, right? I have an array, I want to use a find function or whatever. Uh, how long is it going to take us? So, I have three scenarios that I'm going to check. So, the first one is going to be just, you know, like defining the struct with an int inside, nothing else, no overriding equals, nothing else. Second, I'm going to help it a little bit and override the equals method for my struct. And the third, I'm going to go even further and implement iEquatable interface for my struct. And I would like to see what happens. So let's look. Let's go quickly over uh, the definition of the struct. It's very easy. So first version, struct, value, very simple, nothing else. Second version, struct with value, and I will help C Sharp a little bit by overriding the equals method so that, you know, it doesn't have to think too hard about how to do it. And the last option would be to implement the iEquatable interface, which means that I have to implement an equals method which, which receives that specific struct. And then um, the comparison is even easier because I don't have to think about casting and all that. And this is what my test is going to look like. I am going to initialize three arrays of size 10,000. I'm going to fill each of them with these structs, just like a consecutive list of structs. The first one is going to contain zero, the second one is going to contain one, and so on, until 10,000 or uh, 9,999. And what I'm actually going to test, and we're going to talk about our benchmarking framework in a moment, I will just run uh, structs, that's my array. I'm going to ask whether it contains the last element. Why do I take the last element? Because I want my benchmark to run through the entire array because I want like a mass of work to be done. I could actually also select something that's not in the array, whatever, it's all the same. Now, just one word about benchmarking. Benchmarking is hard. <laughs> you have to think about a lot of stuff, like warming up the cache, the CPU, whatever, taking into account the uh, time that the benchmarking itself takes, like all the stuff uh, around it. Uh, and it's hard, it's hard to do it correctly. So there's a really great uh, library called benchmark.net. It's free, you can get it on Nougat. Some very, very smart people develop it. Um, and it kind of takes care of all of it for you. So you just basically put the uh, benchmark uh, attribute on your functions and you know click run and it outputs this like really nice results with statistics and, and you know uh, uh, mean values and deviations and, and all of that. So I'm not going to run it now because benchmarking takes a lot of time. You have to repeat the experiment many times. Um, so I'll just show you the results. <laughs> These are the results. So we have three functions. We had three types of structs, right? Just like a regular struct with nothing, a struct which implements, uh, which overrides the uh, equals method, and a struct which implements the iEquatable interface. And we can see the time that the, uh, that the contains method took. 
Now, the first thing that I want to concentrate on is the difference between the case of the not equatable struct and the yes equatable uh, struct. Um, and of course, like if you haven't uh, read the results, the equatable struct works much faster than the non-I equatable struct. So let's try to understand what's going on. It's not very complicated. How does searching works? Well, obviously you have to go over all the elements of the array and you know look for the thing that you're searching for. However, you need to be able to compare the elements to find that thing that you're searching for. And comparing primitive types is easy, but if you have your own struct, then it's not necessarily clear how you need to compare it. So you need to create a comparer. And this is the secret here. It turns out that this is where the difference lies. This is where the difference between I equatable and non I equatable comes into play. There is a different comparer for the case that the uh, struct that we're comparing is I equatable than the case that it's not I equatable. And if you think about it for a moment, it really does make sense because if you made your struct I equatable, then obviously you want to call the function that you defined in the interface, right? So this makes sense. Now let's look at these uh, comparer functions. So this is the compare function uh, for the regular uh, object, the one that doesn't implement I equatable. It looks pretty, uh, it makes sense, right? Equals X, Y, you know, check for nullness and essentially go back to calling the equals method. Now, and this is like the, the tricky part, let's analyze what happens when you do X equals Y. So remember, both X and Y are our struct, they're value types, okay? This equals method though, the one that we call here, this one is bound to like the base object equals method. Right, because our struct in this case, it's not I equatable. It only impl implements the um, the regular equals method, and the regular equals method accepts an object as input. So here, y is supposed to be an object, but in fact, we have a struct in our hand. So this struct is boxed we have boxing number one. What about X? X has to be boxed as well. Why? Because the call to equals is a call to a virtual function. And you can't call a virtual function on a struct on a value type without boxing it. Boxing number two. So both X and Y are boxed and we have memory allocations. Very sad. Let's look at the I equatable version on the other hand. The code looks the same, right? I mean, the implementation of the function is the same. Check for null, return x equals y. However, look at this here. We know in this case that x and y are I equatable, right? And so that means that then we call x, x equals, equals y, this equals is bound to the I equatable equals method. And the I equatable equal me equals method accepts a T, a struct as a parameter. So when we pass Y here as a parameter, it's already in the correct type. No boxing, yay. What about X? Now this is a little confusing because a call to an interface is like a call to a virtual function, right? However, so, I mean, we would expect X to be boxed as well. However, the .NET people are very smart, and there is an optimization in the JIT, which says that if we call an interface method on a value type, then it's actually JITted into a direct function call for that type. So here, the JIT knows that X is the, val is the struct, it's the value type, and it has an equals method, and it just goes directly into that method without any boxing at all. That's pretty cool. So, and indeed, 
If we look at the ETW recording of our benchmark, we can see that almost half of the time is spent in that benchmark in calling new. That's a lot of time. And all we wanted is to search an array of ints, essentially. So it's really a shame we had to pay that price. Now, just one word about the last case, which really is awful. It's like on a whole different level from the other two. And the reason for that is just that um, when you don't provide any sort of implementation for an equals method, what happens is that .NET would use reflection to go over all of the fields. And that's just like very inefficient. And that's why you should always, always, always implement equals method for your value ties, because otherwise your performance is just like your application is going to die. <laughs> so, so remember that. All righty, next. So, lambdas. I already said before that we're going to talk about lambdas. We use lambdas every day, all the time. We don't think much about it. Uh, some of us probably know how they work, right? Uh, if you want to capture a variable inside your lambda, what the compiler is going to do is that it's going to simulate like a helper class that will save the data, the capture data, as a member, and it will implement a method that uses, uh, that uses this, uh, this data. And I want to know how much it's going to cost you to do that. So let's see. OK, so I'm going to check four ways of passing data, of capturing data into your Lambda. So. The first, I'm, the simulation is going to be, I want to use lambdas. So let's say that we pass this lambda to a task that we want to start. And I want to use some data in this task. So I'm going to show you four ways that I'm going to do that. The first is just like in the slide, capture the data and use it inside the lambda. OK, that's the easiest way to do that. A slightly um, more advanced uh, um, API is not to capture the data as is, but use an API of, of, of task that allows you to pass the input to the lambda as a parameter. So the lambda actually is a function that gets an, an input, and you pass this input to the lambda from the start new function. The next case I'm going to see is the case that there is no data to capture at all. So I just use some sort of constant value in my lambda. And the last case is very similar to the one above it, only I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar, but a lot of times ReSharper suggests that instead of these uh, simple lambdas, you just use uh, method functions. So essentially, this and this does the same thing, only here I pass a function name instead of a lambda. So I ran this, and let's look at the results. So these are the results. And the first thing that I want you to notice is that there's a general correspondence between uh, the time that, uh, that the benchmark took and the size of the allocations. And I hope it doesn't surprise you by now. Let's try to understand, though, why this happens. So this is the case that we need to capture the state. First, we need to allocate the helper class that's going to hold our data. So that's allocation one. Then we need to allocate the data. That's allocation two. And then we need to allocate the action that we pass to the task. Three allocations in each iteration of the loop. Second case, we're going to pass the data as state to the, to the start new method. So we need to allocate the data. There's no choice. I mean, if we have data, we have data. We need to allocate it. However, look at what happens here. Because we don't need to pass, to keep the data as a member in a helper class, we don't need the helper class at all. So the compiler will generate an action that receives input. And this input is going to be passed by the start new method right here. And it's even smart enough to cache this action so we don't have to allocate it over and over again, which means in this case, we only allocate the data and a single action. In, whoops, sorry. Third case, well, no data, obviously no allocation of data. 
and the same optimization with the action itself. It's a single action, it has an implementation, we just call it over and over again, the action is, uh, is saved, cached. Last case, this is a little sad because we would expect it to be the same as the case before, but this is, I suppose, a bug. I mean, I don't see any reason for this, uh, but when you use uh, um, the method name, the compiler doesn't cache the action for some reason. I don't know why, and so it turns out that we allocate the action over and over again, even though we don't really need it. And this explains the results, right? We have three allocations in the first case for each iteration. Second, iteration, uh, second case, we have only one allocation for each iteration. If there's no data, there's no allocations at all. And the last case, well, I guess that the action uh, data structure is larger than the, uh, than the data uh, data structures, so it turns out that it uses more memory. Um, just a really sad implementation. Awesome. So now, if we take lambdas and boxing together, and we do that a lot when we use link, we really understand that link is the culmination of all evil. It really is. <gasps> oh no. Never mind, never mind. We don't have a lot of time as it is. I'm a little late. So I will just, <laughs> I will just describe in the words, okay? For the link part, I had another benchmark. Um, there was some sort of mathematical computation that I did. I can describe in words, but it's very complicated. It's something like the average number of different uh, characters in all license plates between zero and 10,000, whatever. Okay, it calculates a number. And I had different implementations. You can look it up uh, later in my GitHub uh, account. It had a very nice, like, sort of one-liner uh, link implementation, and the one that uses a loop and even manually transforms uh, uh, numbers to strings so that we can count the number of characters, characters and all that. And so I ran it, and these are the results. <laughs> and you can see that the difference is just absolutely huge. So <laughs> um, the version with the loops runs like 10 times faster than the version with the link. There's another intermediate version, which I did not des describe in words, because the slight windows uh, thing. Um, the difference is huge. You can see that it corresponds to the, num to the size of the memory allocated. Um, I, I think it's just a funny example. It's really bad. So <laughs> in the time that we have left, I want to give you some more general advice about what you can do even further uh, to make your applications better. So the first advice is to not call GC collect. Okay? So you're having memory problems and you know, you decide to call GC collect, but think about it for a moment. You have memory problems, you have a lot of memory uh, used, you have a lot of memory allocated. That means the GC is going to take a long time. So you call GC and you just make things worse. You need to trust the .NET people that they're smart enough and they call GC when they need to call GC. I'm not saying never ever in a hundred years, like maybe you have a very good reason, one in a million times, okay? But like as a general rule, if you have a problem, don't solve it by calling GC collect. And again, this is taken from real life. People actually do that. This is a question I found from someone who was complaining that the third party was calling GC collect and causing his application, you know, like from to stop running, to, to, to work uh, slower. So that's not a solution. Famous last words, I do admit, this is a screenshot from an email from one of my previous uh, work uh, places. We also had GC collect in our code. Uh, we found this out because a, a, a customer was having problems, uh, memory problems, and while we were investigating this, we saw that like, there was some loop calling GC collect, which was just adding to our CPU usage. So I admit, we too have errors. <laughs> Another example is that sometimes you think it helps, but it really doesn't. So this guy uh, was having this, like some sort of producer consumer kind of thing, and his application was crashing because of high memory usage. Out of sheer despair, at some point, he added GC collect in his producer. 
And what do you see? It worked. The application stopped uh, crashing. However, if you go online and read his further uh, explanations to what happened, it turned out that by adding the GC collect inside his producer, he essentially inserted a pause in his code, which allowed the consumer to finish its work. And that helped his application, not the GC collect. I'm going to skip that. You know what, I'm not. I'm going to do this last one, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, prefer value types, not always, but when, it's like, when it makes sense for your application. We already saw the case of the boxing and the point. Value types are much more compact in memory. It means that they consume less memory, they're better for caching, and like all the things that you do on arrays with value types work much faster. So for example, if you're you know, uh, writing on, um, an application that does some sort of image processing, your point, struct with almost point data structure would probably be a value type. Again, taken from real life, this guy was writing a ray tracer in C-sharp. Don't ask me why someone would write a ray tracer in C-sharp. I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's, it's he very heavy on, vector, on uh, arrays of vectors. And he was having severe problems, which all went away once he turned his vector into a struct. So we'll skip this one, because I want to leave you time for, uh, for questions. Um, what did we do today? We saw that we have to think about the memory. Even though we tend to think about CPU, we can't forget about the memory. We saw how we can identify our memory problems. We saw how some of our coding patterns can cause memory problems. And we saw some tips on how we can make it better. I really urge you to look at the last slides of my, uh, my presentation. There are some really interesting uh, examples there, especially seeing them correspond to questions from Stack Overflow, which obviously come from real people. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'm happy to take a little questions now. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. And my question, uh, could you please remind the um, uh, name of extension which can notify yeah, about... Yeah, it's called CLR Heap Analyzer. Okay, thank you much. And... Hi. Hi. Uh, can you go through the uh, uh, cases when uh, calling GC collect is justified enough to use it? Is just what? I'm sorry? Uh, can you please go through the scenarios when calling GC collect is justified enough to use it in real life code? Oh. Mm. This one, please. I want to say that it might be justified if you really need to control when your code does or does not GC collect. I want to say that, but I won't because if you have such a sensitive application, maybe .NET or any other managed framework is not the base, best selection for that. And moreover, even in .NET, there are two APIs that allow you to either ask or tell .NET not to run garbage collection on a specific critical code path. Okay, so maybe that would be a better solution rather than calling GC collect. I won't say that we haven't tested it for debugging and stuff like that. I mean, it might help you figure out while developing what's going on, but I, I really have a hard time thinking of what, like, of, of a, an absolutely legit case to use it. Okay, who has more questions? Hi. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. And I have two questions. First of all, uh, uh, to what you present on speech uh, can be uh, applied to analyze some uh, web application, maybe API, or it's only for desktop. And second uh, question is, uh, have you some experience or best practice for uh, analyzing memory when you use uh, unsafe mode? Um, so, as for the second question, no, I apologize, I don't. However, uh, 
memory profilers in general usually support both, uh, both uh, uh, managed and uh, native. And I'm sure that the commercial tools can help with that. I don't have personal experience, so, so I can't give you examples. But and, uh, most of them have uh, trial, uh, trial uh, downloads, so you can try it out. Like if you have a specific case that you want to, self, to solve, I'm sure that you can even just you know, use the trial. Are you recording this? <laughs> yes, I <they're> recorded. <laughs> um, as for the first question, um, like generally, I'm not a web developer, but if you have a server like you know ASP.NET or whatever, then and, and it's running on Windows, then then uh, ETW and performance counters they're available on that server as well. So you can use you can use these tools. And in fact, I, I already said that before. ETW has a lot more data than just memory. It also has specific data for like requests and and. I'm pretty sure that there's stuff for ASP as well, so so yeah, you can use these tools. And obviously, you can also install a profiler there. Uh, but just you know, usually we don't profile production. But if it's a development environment, then you can do that. Okay, thank you. I've got a small question about uh, that slide that we didn't spend a lot of time on, uh, about Linku and cycles, yeah, and... About what, I'm sorry? Uh, Linku oh, and yeah. simple cycles. Yeah. yeah. There was a statistic that simple cycle is better than Linku, and my question is, I'm not sure if it's a common problem, maybe, or uh, the topic for argue uh, for developers uh, who are here, actually. Uh, but uh, still, you know, if you write some code, uh, sometime your colleagues uh, said that just rewrite to link you because it looks uh, pretty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I would like you to comment and maybe yes. spend more time to so describe <laughs> this uh, statistic. So, yeah, Thank so, you. Uh, well, yeah, resharper, a lot of, it's funny because we also had that in the example of the uh, method group. And it's something that Resharper really likes to tell you to do. Hey, convert this you know, lambda to a method group, and then you're screwed. Um, and uh, so it's the same with link, I suppose. A lot of tools would uh, you know, suggest you, hey, convert this loop into a link statement. It, it looks much better. And it's true. It does look much better. And what I want to say about that is I actually forgot to say something in my summary, because I was a little stressed about time. Things are not as bad as I made it seem, seem in, this, uh, in this talk, right? I mean, this talk is to show you the effect that might happen if something really severe happens. You don't have to complicate or uh, uglify your code and make it unreadable to optimize things that aren't important. But if you have a critical code path in your code, if you have some you know, statistical analysis over an array of, I don't know, 100,000 data structures, and, and it's a critical point in your application, then I wouldn't use link. I just wouldn't. <laughs> Not to mention that, at least for me, it's harder to debug, but I don't know. That's also a pre personal preference. Uh, okay, um, thanks for the presentation. It was uh, pretty interesting. I've got a question regarding, uh, so you're encouraging us to use uh, value types. However, you know, we are, well, the, the, the majority of cases uh, of what we are doing, we're programming, we are working with collections and, um, well, storing the huge amounts of uh, value types on a heap and we need to work them on a stack. So um, if we do that, and especially if you have like big structures with too many fields, it will lead us to the situation when you have to pull hold, hold the struct onto the stack. Yeah, so first of all, there's, I'm not sure at what time, but there is a talk about heap memory management and stack memory management. Uh, I think it's later today. So, you know, uh, I encourage you, it's not my talk, it's other people's talk, so I encourage you to go to these talks. It's true, and that's why I said, or I'm not sure if it's written down, but I did say use value types when appropriate. A very, very good example of that is anything that has to do with uh, uh, image uh, processing, geometrical analysis, where arrays of vectors and points are very abundant. 
these vectors and points, they only have two, three, four, you know, members. So yeah, probably if you have a very large data structure, then it's probably not good. But the thing is that it's valid for really any kind of uh, scenario where you ask me, so it's better to do this or that. There is no general answer for that. You need to be aware of the differences and you need to know how to measure and compare what works for your application. I don't know to tell you what is exactly the number of uh, elements in a vector after which you have to use structs and before that and can be classes or, you know, or vice versa. You need to check how it works for your application, for your workloads. But you have to understand that there is a price for that. There is a difference in how these arrays are represented in memory and it affects what your application does. Um, if you have data, I don't know, like, I, in some cases we use classes and in some cases we use structs and it's okay. There is not one rule for everything. So if you have a very large data structure, that makes sense. If you have very expensive data structures, I, sadly I skipped that. But if you have very expensive data structures, then it also might be worth it to use some sort of pooling or caching mechanism. Right? And in fact, and specifically talking about arrays, if you need very large like, uh, chunks of bytes, you should, look out, you should check out uh, system buffers, which allows you to deal with large byte arrays and sub-arrays in a more efficient manner, rather than just like copying around and allocating all the time. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, I've checked the, the buffers and um, system memory and uh, system read-only memory and span, of course. Uh, the problem is with them that, of course, yeah, using span, I can use um, structures by ref, by reference, which allows me not to, you know, pull everything onto the stack. Oh, well, it's already on the stack uh, on, on majority of the cases. Uh, but, that, that, but that's the problem that uh, another structure like, like plain list, they don't allow you to reference the stack from, from its indexer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, I just don't, I don't know if that's the, um, if it should be implemented, like maybe pretty soon. But for now, um, I don't really see uh, that using um, value types are convenient in most cases. And um, may maybe you have some suggestions here. Uh, we'd probably need to look at your specific case. Uh like maybe not right yeah, okay, now. Okay, okay, thanks, thanks. <laughs> but I, again, I want to stress out, I'm not saying you should always use value types, but it's possible and it might help in a lot of cases. It might not. Okay, this was the uh, last question. If you have more, uh, you can look for our speaker uh, during all conference and uh, let's uh, uh, around applause for our speaker here. Thank you. <laughs>